All right. We're going to go to Acts chapter 26, verse 2. Uh, yeah. Lesson today is going to be a little more topical than normal. I'd like to consider the topic of biblical happiness. Amen. Yeah. Now, just to give a context here without having to read six chapters of Acts, Paul had been determined to go down to Jerusalem, led the Lord, and he was arrested. And he had for two years in prison. He is here about to come before Agrippa. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the same imprisonment that would lead him to Rome, where he'd spend two years on house arrest. So I think that was his last time in prison that he was killed after that. Some suggest that maybe he was freed and then in prison later again in Rome. I don't know the Bible doesn't record. Mm-hmm. It just ends, Acts ends with him serving God under Roman house arrest. Yeah. But here, like I said, he's been for about two years, according to chapter 24, in prison. Just no doubt having to a uh, probably write letters and pray, but not able to, I'm sure, travel and preach like he would like to. Right. You know, we think about like the time in Acts 16 when the earthquake came and him and Paul and Silas were loosed. We were in another place in Acts where the angel came and led Peter out. But yeah. Then we have instances like this. We don't seem to think about them as much. Right. But all that and then Considering all of that, and yet Paul could describe himself as happy here in chapter, verse number two. He says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, Amen. because I shall answer for myself this day before the, the touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. But it was just a couple chapters before when he was arrested that the Jews, it says they were literally ready to pull him in pieces. Right. And right after that, the group of them took an oath that they weren't even going to eat until they had killed Paul. Mm-hmm. He said it had been two years had passed, and he had appealed all the way up to Caesar himself, but apparently their government didn't get in a hurry for things either. Right. And yet he could say he, could say he was happy, even in that. And despite all this, he could stand before King Agrippa here and say, I think myself happy. Amen. I think most of us would say, well, could not say the same, could we? That we would be happy despite all that's going on. Right. So I think the key to Paul's happiness and the key to biblical happiness is contentment. He was content where God would have him to be. Mm-hmm. First Timothy 6 6 says, Godliness with contentment is a great gain. Amen. Right. You can't be, this might sound obvious, but you can't be happy when you're always unhappy about your current situation. You're right. Amen. And that's the case with at least many Americans today, isn't it? Mm-hmm. They're satisfied with what they have or what they're doing, which, like I said, I know Brother Larry desires something to work better with his ministry, and that's not a bad desire to have. Yes. I sometimes wish my job would work better with me, too. Mm-hmm. But to always want bigger and better and more things, that's not biblical contentment. Amen. When you're always striving after things and the things of this world, you won't find true happiness. Amen. You might find temporary little happiness that'll fade away very soon. Mm-hmm. You know, we, you buy a new car, for example, and well, you're happy you got a new car until the payments come around or something goes yeah. on. Yeah. Same thing with houses and really just about everything in this world might bring pleasure for a season, but that's yeah. not true biblical happiness. Mm. Amen. So Paul was he was content here to serve God wherever that would lead him. He was content to do the work of God even if that would cause him to give his own life. In fact, all the way back in the beginning of this, Acts chapter 20, let's turn there. 
And he expresses this. Acts chapter 20. Here are some of the others that advised Paul against going to Jerusalem. When we get in verse number 22, he says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit in Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Notice verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto me, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. And now behold, I excuse me. Now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Amen. No, Paul. He says he didn't even count his life dear unto him. Just that he would finish his course with joy in the ministry which he had received with the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's not an easy place to get to, is it? But it, mm -hmm. that's how Paul could be happy in any situation, that he would just simply start, desire to serve God no matter what it cost him. Amen. When you hold on tight to things of this world, they'll bring disappointment. You're right. Mm -hmm. oh, how we ought to as the followers of God hold on very loosely to them. Mm -hmm. God can show you very easily that they can be quickly removed from you. That's it. But with the things that we receive of God, those will not depart from us. I said true biblical happiness cannot be found in the things of this world. It can really ultimately be found in serving God. And that's not coming to church on Sunday and doing nothing else. Amen. That's being willing to even give our life if it so calls on us to do. So I know that's contrary to the society's thinking today. Society seen, sees Christianity as just a almost like a hobby, it seems like. Mm -hmm. You put everything else first, and then when you have time, you can be a Christian. Right. But for a true child of God, that will always be a miserable condition to be in. So the things of this world always end up bringing misery, given enough time. Amen. Let's turn back to Psalms and look at a few reasons the Scriptures give for that we can be happy as the people of God. Well, the first one's probably one of the more obvious ones that I've alluded to here. Psalms 144. This is not a definite list, but there is this is quite several of the passages which <clears throat> tell us sources for true happiness. Psalms 144 and verse 15. It says, Happy is that people, as in such a case, ye happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Amen. Although we have Jehovah as our God, that is something that causes us happiness. Amen. You know, really, we ought to be the happiest of people on earth, shouldn't we? Mm -hmm. And we serve the true God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We don't serve some God who's demanding of doing enough good works and will be accepted. We don't serve a God who who might save us if we're a good enough person. But we have the great God Jehovah as our God, not some weakling God, not some, you know, just spectator type God that many people believe in today. Right. But the very one who controls all things and works all things together for our good. Amen. That is the God that we serve. And that's the fact that we can claim him as our God ought to give us happiness. I remember Brother Rich used to say most Christians are they have faces long enough to drink buttermilk out of a churn. They ought not to be with people of God. Uh, yeah. Turn over to Psalms 146 and verse number 5. Here it says, Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. 
But the God helps us how to bring us happiness. Amen. That God would be pleased to even help us. Well, he certainly doesn't have to, if you will. But that He so cares for us that He would give us aid when we need it. Amen. And then He goes on further to say, whose hope is in the Lord is God. The fact that we have hope in God is more reason to bring happiness to us. Amen. Not as the world offers hope that's not real hope, but we have, as the Hebrew writer describes it, hope that is steadfast and sure. Amen. A hope that can actually be counted on. Not some hope like you hope to win the lottery and you have basically no chance of winning. <laughs> so our hope is one we can count on, that Christ is coming back, that sin will be vanquished, that will be forever in the Lord. Well, that ought to give us happiness as the people of God. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 16. Verse number 20. He that handleth the matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Amen. Trusting in God can bring us this happiness. Mm -hmm. Why, well, I remind of Proverbs 3 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not on thy own understanding. Mm -hmm. I read that yesterday, and I was. I had the thought that if God is not sovereign, there's not much assurance there to trust in Him, is it? Right. He's not dead. So, uh, there's much assurance in trusting in the sovereign God. That's it. Amen. I you know how that ought to bring us happiness, that we can trust in Him, that He is, I guess you could say, capable of being trusted in. Mm -hmm. No man will let you down. Right. The gods of this world will fail you, but oh, the God of the Bible, He is the one that can be trusted. Amen. And if we just simply would trust Him, He'll prove that over and over again. Mm -hmm. Going on to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs 28, verse 14. It says, Happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardens his heart shall fall into mischief. Mm -hmm. okay. Having the fear of God, that can bring happiness. You will not have true happiness if you don't fear him. Amen. So he says, He that hardens his heart shall fall into mischief. Mm -hmm. so the people that just want to live their life pleasing to themselves, to follow the flesh, to want to do what makes themselves happy, if you will. Mm -hmm. What they're saying is that they always find mischief, they always find trouble. Right. Oh, when we fear God, that will cause us to we'll really to serve Him, trust in Him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, happy is the man that fears all of these. Those that come up against God, they always have trouble as well, don't they? Right. Amen. But not so for the man that feareth God. I'm not saying we won't have trouble in this world. In fact, Christ said in this world he shall have tribulation. Mm -hmm. Be of the cheer I have overcome the world. Amen. No fear not them that kill the body, but fear him that had, after he hath killed, you have the power to cast in hell. Yeah, I'm saying you fear him. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 12 tells us. No fear God you can have this biblical happiness. So, or chapter 29. Verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Mm -hmm. Serving God will bring happiness, won't it? We see that in Paul's case. I think he really encompasses all these things that we've talked about. But mm -hmm. That he had Jehovah's his God, that God was his help. In fact, it said the Lord stood by him when he was there in prison. Amen. He trusted in God no matter what the situation brought. Certainly he uh, feared God. And he was striving his best to serve God. 
But we got to keep it the law. I'm not saying we got to go back under the old Jewish law, but keeping the commandments of God. Amen. That will bring us happiness. Oh, when man strives to do his own thing, that misery always comes, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Sin always brings misery with it. We'll go back to Job for a minute. This one might not seem as obvious. Job chapter 5. Verse number 17. Here it says, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Amen. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Mm -hmm. It was like God corrects us. That might not seem like something to bring happiness, but it gives us assurance that we are his sons. Hebrews 12 tells us that. Verse 5 through 11. But I think verse 6 says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. And verse 11 tells us that no chastisement of the present seemeth joyous, but afterward he yields peaceful fruits of righteousness. Amen. And he does it not for his own good, but for our good, it says. That's it. Oh, God would not be a very good God if he just left us out in sin to go more and more into sin. Right. Oh, but he loves us so that he would correct us and bring us back into fellowship with him. And that is something that we can be happy about. Amen. So it might not seem that way at the time, but oh, that we are His and that He corrects us is enough to bring us happiness. Amen. Let's go to one more place in, over in First Peter, and we'll close. No. <laughs> First Peter chapter four. This one really seems contradictory to our modern society, but even modern day Christianity, in a general sense, seems contradictory too. But verses 13 and 14 say, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be also ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Amen. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Amen. You might wonder how this suffering can bring happiness, but well, we realize that one, it's bringing glory to Christ, and two, that one day those sufferings will be traded in for eternal glory. How that all can bring us happiness. Amen. As Paul said in Romans 8, I reckon that the suffering of this present life are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. Well, these sufferings, if you will, are only for a short while. I see it. Oh, but even in those things, God is glorified. Amen. That we are even worthy to suffer shame for his sake. The disciples rejoice. Should we not be rejoicing the same? Mm -hmm. Amen. No, he doesn't, if I could say this way, he doesn't give sufferings to those who have harder callers. Amen. You're right. No, that's not enticing to the flesh, but yet to the Spirit it all brings us happiness that we can, that we're serving God so that we can suffer for Him. I'm not saying we've got to seek out sufferings, but if you just live godly, sufferings will find you. Mm -hmm. Amen. I know that those are nothing compared to the glory which weighs us all around his happiness. Well, like I said the world seeks after happiness every day, but yet they don't find it. Mm -hmm. They say the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that's right in our Declaration of Independence here in America. Amen. It's seen as a basic human right, and yet man seeks after it and never finds that true happiness because they're seeking it in the wrong places. You know, sometimes when excuses made, I just want to be happy, or God would just want me to be happy. <laughs> well, God's primary concern isn't your happiness, but oh, you can find happiness in serving Him. Amen. But you're not going to find it in 
sin, you're not going to find it in the things of this world. No, we can be like Paul and even in the midst of imprisonments and beatings and having people desire to kill us, we can still be happy. Amen. Let's close with that thought.